Hello and welcome to today's edition of The Listening Lounge. My name is Nick Day and I'm CEO of JGA Recruitment Group and we're specialist payroll and HR recruiters. Now they say the quieter we are, the more we hear and that listening is the secret to discovering the greatest of stories. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's fantastic guest. Today, I am joined by Gary Henderson, who's manager in the National Minimum Wage Team with the People Advisory Services for Ernst & Young. And today is all going to be about national minimum wage. What are the kind of things that we should be looking out for, um, in, especially in relation to HMRC, national minimum wage enforcements in particular? We've seen a lot of this on, on social media, people talking about this uh, online. So what are the things we should be looking out for? What's really interesting with that is, you know, most kind of businesses and most clients that I speak to, you ask them who deals with their national minimum wage, and they've never usually got one person that deals mm. with it. It's kind of split across finance, payroll, HR. So it's always one of these things where maybe the kind of knowledge within businesses um, is lacking slightly just because it's such a niche area um, within the, the structure of the business and they've not got one person who kind of specifically the expert on it. So with HMRC Enforcement, just to give the, the background on this for anybody that doesn't know is HMRC Enforce the national minimum wage on behalf of what's called the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, known as BASE. So they enforce it and what they do is they investigate businesses through the year. They do, you know, thousands each year. They do that based on complaints that come from workers and ex-workers, but they also do it based on sectors, risk profiling, different kind of geographical areas. They, they look at a number of different ways, you know, which would lead to them opening an investigation. And then if they find as part of that investigation that somebody's underpaid the minimum wage, they instruct them to pay back the workers who've been underpaid. But on top of that comes a penalty, which can be up to 200% of their arrears. And also comes with, this is a big kicker that most companies want to avoid, is the public naming side of it. It's one yeah. of the only kind of heads of tax, one of the only kind of HMRC tax bracketed things that comes with that public naming warning on the side of it. And companies get named and shamed. And because it's such a social thing and because it's such a hot topic, it always makes the newspapers, it always makes social media and can really be you know, properly damaging uh, for a business's uh, reputation. So that's the kind of background of it. But going on to this year, what we're kind of hearing uh, from the HMRC side of it is that they're expanding. They're always expanding uh, the National Minimum Wage Department. As I said, when I started, there was about 50 there. I think it's closer to 500 now. So wow. the, the numbers, yeah, the, the feet on the ground have expanded so much uh, over the course of the last kind of eight, nine years. And they seem to be concentrating this year a lot on larger businesses. So they have these enforcement teams who look at larger businesses where you've got huge workforces and a lot of the issues and problems come around technicalities. So it's not maybe the kind of historical national minimum wage problem of a hairdresser down the road's got three workers and kind of pays them five pounds an hour to, to sweep hair off the floor and make teas and they've been underpaid. It's now looking at multinational huge businesses and looking across entire workforces. So their business and data analytics um, capabilities are increasing every year as well and that's just giving them more insight you know into these larger businesses specifically we're kind of hearing that they're shifting their approach slightly now they would usually look sectorally at these things so you would have things like the hospitality industry you would have the retail industry and you'd have like things like the manufacturing industry they would be the kind of main ones we would go back to again and again when I was at HMRC because that's where all the common failings came about but what we're hearing this year and specifically from one area in Belfast at the moment is that HMRC are looking at a kind of geographical approach to things so they're picking you know certain areas around the country and they're getting in there for kind of sharp intense enforcement action in that specific area so what we've kind of ascertain from our work in Belfast and what clients are saying back to us is they're receiving letters that are offering them national minimum wage health checks so they're being invited forward to speak to HMRC out with an investigation which is a slightly new tact from HMRC and um, to give them a health check on their minimum wage but kind of crucially they're also writing to workers so they're contacting I think there was thousands and thousands of workers in the Belfast area. I think one of the numbers I heard from uh, from another agency was there was 30,000 workers they'd been told in Belfast had been um, contacted. And what the problem is there 
is HMRC are kind of duty-bound in their service level agreements to action 100% of national minimum wage complaints that come through within five days, I think it is. So when these complaints come through, it could be something as simple as, you know, I never got paid last week. I didn't get paid for my pay last week. And if they look at that, that and they kind of triage that call and it opens an investigation, it opens an investigation on the entire business. So you could have wow. ten, you could have ten thousand workers, but one person's just had, you know, some sort of kind of spurious underpayment that quite rightly they deserve back they complained about, but it opens up the floodgates on this entire investigation. And when HMRC open an investigation, particularly on larger businesses, they can be there for three and four years and they can kind of delve very deeply in these things. And not, not only have you then got the kind of issue around penalties and naming, but it's just the it's the time and resource that it takes yeah, HR sure. professionals, payroll professionals to actually deal with this as well. So that's kind of the most concerning, but I suppose maybe for uh, businesses is not the fact that they're, they're in the areas and they're probably opening cases in these specific areas, but that they're contacting so many workers and they're kind of nudging them towards, have a think about your pay, have a think about, have you worked through breaks? Have you been unpaid for this working time? Have you had a, dedu a deduction for something else? And it's getting the kind of getting the mind ticking over um, for that. And, you know, that can very easily lead to, you know, a big, big burden for employers going forward. I, I know that um, yeah, there are a lot of common challenges as well when it comes to national minimum wage. I know that, you know, when I, when I host payroll question time, there's certainly a lot of confusion around national minimum wage and the national living wage, for example. But what are some of the, the common pitfalls, common challenges that you, that you come across when you're working with your clients? So I'll, just, I'll touch on that uh, when you mentioned there about national minimum wage national living wage really quickly because I think I remember there was a run of at least 30 webinars that I did when I was in HMRC that the one of the first questions was always what's the difference between national minimum yeah. wage and national living wage so I always like just covering that one straight away and it's very very simply that the national living wage is just the name for the rate for those age 23 and over and um, so when it got introduced there was a lot of confusion because you had the real living wage the national living wage, the national minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. So for, yeah, minimum wage purposes, just for anybody who maybe doesn't know, is you've got the five different minimum wage rates and the highest one is just for those age 23 and over. And that's just called, it's just branded as the national living wage. Still all right. under the exact same legislation, still kind of covered by the same rules. Um, but that's, that's always one I feel is always worthwhile covering because I take it for granted so much that it's sure. dead straightforward. Yeah. But so many people do ask the question. In terms of the kind of most common challenges that are, that are facing businesses just now, the main risks that exist, they tend to be fairly consistent and, and sometimes they have new ways of kind of displaying themselves in the real world, but they tend to come down to, and I'll, I'll do a, a chart-like countdown for you just now, but the, the top right. one, number one, is always, always around unpaid working time. That's a really, really broad term, unpaid working time. It covers a lot of things, but it does come up time and time again. Probably the most common one is just those small kind of slivers of time before and after a shift. Now, the, the very, very basic broad brush rule that I like to give on this is any time where an employer requires a worker to be somewhere or requires them to be doing something, they're generally working for national minimum wage purposes. So if I work maybe in a shop and I start at 9 a.m., but they tell me I need to come in at nine, sorry, at 10 to 9 to kind of open up get things prepared, clock in, sign in, whatever else, that 10 minutes should also be included as working time. Back end of the shift, I need to go through a security check on the way out to make sure I've not nicked anything from the factory. Uh, I need to change out of PPE or change out of equipment, or I need to do any sort of handover with staff coming in. Again, if there's a requirement for me to be there or doing something, then it's going to count towards my working time in that day. And that's one, you know, we, we're dealing with, you know, clients every day where that's still kind of coming up as an issue, changing time before and after shifts, having to just be somewhere to clock in. And it can be just a couple of minutes and it's amazing how quickly it all adds up. So even if you're just asking somebody to clock in and they have to clock in on a computer, but they have to queue up to clock in. So that takes them five minutes to queue up and clock in and everything. You might think that the natural thing to say is, oh, so a couple of minutes doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's fine, few minutes here, few minutes there. 
but we did, I think we did some exercises and the, the figures here aren't going to be exact by any stretch of the imagination, but five minutes before and after a shift for somebody in minimum wage over five days a week, extrapolated over the six years the HMRC can go back on these things for a workforce of 5,000 people. So we say everybody's affected in the same way on minimum wage, works out at a charge of 37 million pounds for that, that business when you're taking into account underpayments and penalties. So wow. the, yeah. the figures can get pretty wild pretty quickly when you're taking that over a large workforce. And those things you think is just such a simple kind of not really bothering too much about it, a few minutes here and there does very quickly add up. And HMRC do enforce on that. I just did a really quick calculation. I mean, you mentioned two, uh, queuing for two minutes, two minutes a day, we call it 15 minutes a week. It's 12 hours a year. Yeah, and it, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, uh, and and it's very easy to overlook the kind of seriousness of it when you think it's only a couple of minutes here and there. But again, I, I always come back to the the kind of thought that there's always people at the end of these numbers and at the end of these decisions. And for something that's on minimum wage, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours is best part of 100 quid, 120 quid. And that can be a big, big difference maker yeah. for a lot of people. Thank you for joining me on today's episode of The Listening Lounge. My name is Nick Day. And remember, every great conversation starts with great listening. Till next time.